Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 331. Addiction to drugs is a method of self-treatment for missing neurotransmitters. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. I've been in private practice as a family therapist for 30 something years, 30 plus years. And when I was in school, and I grew up in a family that have, have, has chronic alcohol addiction issues throughout my family, generations of my family. So I, I always felt like I was knowledgeable about addictions from an experiential and an educational standpoint. What I was taught in school and, and what we believed systemically was that addictions are characterological deficits. It's a weakness in self-discipline. It's a weakness in self-esteem. It's a weakness in strength and character that somebody becomes addicted to a substance like nicotine or alcohol. And the, the, the general belief was, well, just quit. Just don't do it. Uh, or, or addicted to any other substance, sex, food, what have you. That is just, uh, if, if you have an issue with a problem like that, especially a substance of some kind, that there's a flaw in you that we need to identify and correct. And so therapy was aimed at learning self-esteem, learning self-discipline, identifying uh, signs of anxiety or depression, and trying to teach methodologies for being less anxious or less depressed. But over the 30 plus years that I've been working in this field as a professional, I have come to believe, and I think the informational focus, the scientific focus has shifted to a belief that addictions are diseased substrates and that they are caused by malfunctions, misfunctions uh, within the neurological structure of the brain. So today we want to talk about what current science is showing about the addictive process and the neurotransmitter uh, <coughs> issues in the brain. When you read about this stuff, you have to learn about something called the synaptic transfer and the synaptic cleft, uh, break down all the little things where there's a chemical electrical signal that kicks something loose from one end of a synaptic cleft and it swims across the gap in a fluid solution and it's reabsorbed on the other side. And that's how messages go, you know, reflexively from, from one synapse to the next to get to where they're going in the brain. Uh, so scientists have broken all those things down and we know things about neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine and dopamine and norepinephrine uh, and reuptake inhibitors. Uh, all that means is all that stuff. Yeah. And makes but in learning about that stuff and particularly about regions of the brain where the reward centers for motivation mm -hmm. seem to be located, we're learning a lot about addiction. Yeah, and, and so you have some things to share with us about what you know as a physician who has studied this that is so new to me, uh, and I'm really mm -hmm. fascinated by it. Well, we, start, we started out looking at um, addiction and treating it like we're going to deprive you of the drug that you have, that you need or want or desire or right, whatever. Right, alcohol, nicotine. Whatever your ad addiction drug of choices. We're going to deprive you of that and we're going to make you calm down and give you behavioral methods to right. stop needing that right. particular drug. And right. we found that Didn't it doesn't work. work. It doesn't work. It's billions of dollars later. It just doesn't work. And part of that is the reason you have an addiction. Not, now, not everyone has an addictive personality and not everyone has the genetics for addiction. Okay. Right. So many of us can sit on high ground and go, ah, oh, that's not me. I'm so much better than somebody else who has that. That's just simply not true. We all have our genetic problems. Everybody has genetic defects. Well, having a genetic defect for alcoholism or now we find marijuana fits into one of those addictions, although, however, less dangerous than most of the other drugs. But we find that you're filling a gap in your neurotransmitters, in those chemicals in your brain with a substance that you can find because no one's giving you that substance with a medication, right? So you have a need, medicine doesn't give it to you, 
and we then you go find it, and then that ends up being illicit drug use, right? We criminalize self medication, and then we criminalize it, and it makes right. it even more difficult. And we and, spend a lot of money on prisons and jails and and police uh, systems that could be better spent on medical systems for the research and the treatment to find the the right chemical substance and the way to deliver it to the brain that could fill the hole. There are many neurotransmitters and each type of drug of addiction gives you a boost in one or several of these neurotransmitters mm -hmm. so that you feel normal again. And sadly, when people are, are what they call dry drunks, they're yes. alcoholics, but yes. they don't drink. They are, <laughs> it's not that I want them to drink. I want them to have their neuro, neuro, neurologic function back, but they are a, a, a shadow of themselves. My, they seem to be missing something. My grandfather was an alcoholic and he got in trouble with the law for drunk driving. And so the courts made him take a substance called an abuse for 30 or 45 days. And every day my grandmother had to drive him to the police station. They gave him this tablet. He had to take it. And this is a 60 year old man. An abuse in, isn't in, a neurotransmitter. No, no. It's a punishment. But it, what it did, he had to take it and swallow it and then open his mouth, stick his tongue out, move it around so they could see that he had taken the drug. If he had taken that drug, then he could not drink for 24 hours without getting physically very sick mm -hmm. and throwing up. So it had nothing to do with his addiction. It had nothing to do with why he drank or any of the feelings that he had that impelled him to drink. It physically, it, it was like electric shock therapy. It just kept right. him from being able to drink. Because if you took a drink, and you'd vomit all day. I remember as a child, this was going on. And he had a calendar in the kitchen hanging on the wall. And he was marking off the days. And the day he went to get his last abuse tablet, he stopped at the liquor store and got a case of beer and a fifth of whiskey. And he came home to have a party to celebrate as soon as it wore off of his system. So it never affected it his doesn't. drinking. It, but, but it's the way we thought about treating it when I was a child. But what if, what if you were starving Yeah. and no one gave you food? Yes. And and we have and we the knowledge beat you because you wanted food. And we beat you because you were hungry. Right. To me, that's what that's what addiction is. Yes. And unfortunately I've come to learn that. I, I I agree with you. By not treating people, by giving them a medication, a chemical, something that gives them the neurotransmitter they desire or need, right. then we are making them into criminals or they're using drugs that aren't they may do the job but they're very detrimental to the rest of their health they they actually cause damage to the brain because they're not exactly what they need right and and they may have all kinds of other chemicals well, in them that damages the research their body that we've done is showing uh is that addictive drugs cause chemical and structural changes in the brain mm -hmm. because they're not an exact fit it's like like stretching out a buttonhole on a shirt you know, the button that's made for that buttonhole should just go right mm -hmm. through the hole. But the chemicals the, of the addictive variety, like mm -hmm. alcohol or, or opiates mm -hmm. or heroin, they're not quite the right size. And so you force them in there mm -hmm. and they stretch it out and it changes. So then the right size button doesn't work either. So, so, so then you have an additional problem. And that, then you have a second problem that then it's hard to fix. Yes. Once because we haven't been treating people with the right medication. So, let's look at um, ADD, mm -hmm. which is not an, a great example. Which is not an addiction to amphetamines. Yeah. It we have finally figured out that ADD is a lack of norepinephrine for some reason, genetic or otherwise. Like people who have ADD have family members who have narcolepsy. Right. I mean, it's, it's a lack of norepinephrine or a stimulant. So we figured out that if we give them that stimulant back, they act normally. It's not like trying to calm them down. They're just normal. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to through the years who had family members that struggle with ADD, and, and particularly parents and children, where the, the typically the dad is saying, I don't want to drug my kid. Those teachers just don't want to deal with him. He's just a boy being a boy. And, you know, he can't stay in his seat. He can't keep his mouth shut. He can't keep he his can't hands to uh, He's not making friends. He doesn't have the social cueing that he needs to learn how to be uh, acceptable. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many things that if you give him the amphetamine, if you give him the speed that his body requires mm -hmm. so that his brain functions normally, mm -hmm. then you see these changes in behavior. And so many of Back those to kids and adults that have taken the ADD drugs will tell me
the noise stops. Right. Suddenly, I, I, I'm clear headed. I can think. The confusion I stops. The, the dysfunction oh my stops. Gosh. It's and like so relieved. They're like normal. They calm down. They're normal. Now, if someone doesn't have ADD and takes mm -hmm. this medication, then they get hyper. They get and hyper. It's, it's, it's the drug. opposite. I, one psychiatrist told me that ADD is like you're wired backwards. You take Benadryl, mm -hmm. makes everybody else go to sleep, and makes you wake up. You take an, you take a, um, like a Percocet. Everybody else goes to sleep or has some euphoria. You right. wake up and go crazy. So you can't take it as a pain medicine because if you're in pain, you shouldn't be running around the house. Right. So, so it's it's why it's a neurotransmitter defect. Well, and the same approach over the last twenty or thirty years has been to, to convince these kids and families that these are not characterological deficits. It's not this something is not wrong with control. who you are, you or how you were how brought to up, it and help him manage it. Mm -hmm. And and what we teach are compensatory strategies. Mm -hmm. So it, it, the medicine helps. The medicine helps enormously, mm -hmm. but if you have a family that won't give the medicine, then the kid is going to have the problem, and he can learn some compensatory strategies that help reduce the cost of the problem, but he's still mm -hmm. going to have the problem, mm -hmm. uh, and they don't outgrow it. I mean, you, you, need the, you need the chemical in your brain. And people who have ADD, if they're not treated, the drug they choose mm -hmm. is marijuana because marijuana does this similar thing in their brain that ADD medicine does, but it has other side effects, making them hungry and making them tired. And so it doesn't do, it's not the exact fit, but that's a drug they choose. An extensive, intensive abuse of marijuana leads to three or four visible traits. Uh, boys who excessively use marijuana for a long period of time grow man boobs. Yeah, they have breasts. And it's painful. And it's ugly. And, and it's ugly. Uh, if, if, if it's not that, that you focus on, then the three things you're going to see for them, uh, excessive use, cause they'll tell you, oh, it's not a problem. It's not addictive. It, it is, uh, mm -hmm. anger. They get really angry, fundamentally angry. Mm -hmm. Uh, they lose their ability to make good decisions, to make decisions, period. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they have trouble deciding if they want to go, if they're hungry or if they want to go out in the mm -hmm. kitchen and fix something to eat. Uh, and organizational thoughts, they have trouble organizing their thoughts in any kind of problem solving way. Mm -hmm. So excessive abuse of marijuana leads to those deficits. Mm -hmm. So once again, somebody who's looking for an answer to their problem because they don't feel right, hasn't found it in medicine or whose parents won't let them have it, mm -hmm. then go out and find something else that causes other problems. It ends up being like a snowball rolling down a hill. I mean, it's harder to take care of people once they've become addicted to something that isn't the perfect drug, uh -huh. then if you just were treating them and giving them back the medication they need exactly. Mm -hmm. So in this, I, I was always, when I was um, in high school, you know, I went to, I went to Young Life. That's a Christian organization. And they always said there's there, every person has a whole, this is just, I'm just stating what they say. Every person has a hole inside of them yeah. where, where God fits. And if you don't have God, then you like have this hole. You have to yeah, have like an empty spot. Right. So this is how I view addicts. Everybody who has an addictive right. personality has a reason mm -hmm. that they're looking for something to mm -hmm. fill that hole because they don't feel right. Okay. And so the comparison that often gets made it, and what we've learned with the research is those holes seem to be clustered around the centers of the brain that regulate uh, pleasure and satisfaction. Right. So food, water, sex, mm -hmm. those things also then become addictions. The cravings mm -hmm. for food, the inability mm -hmm. to stop eating, the weight issue. Uh, and also are genetic. Sexual acting out. They are genetic. 50% of the people have the genetic defect, but only 10 or less percent of the people become addicts. Right. So some so, people just go, no, I don't think so. You, well, I never wanted much to find more complex out than that. But I mean, I never but, wanted to find out if I would I would become addicted to something because then I knew I wanted to be a doctor. There was no way that was happening. Right, right. So I always looked through medical medical answers and not other answers because I didn't want to have a criminal record. So I just didn't do it. I just or, didn't or you try found it. a more socially acceptable addiction. You're a workaholic. You've <laughs> always been a workaholic. Yeah, well, I have always been a. Workaholic. I don't mind that one. <laughs> but it does have some costs mm -hmm. in terms of social relationships and free time and, and mm -hmm. what have you, the ability to relax, the ability to turn mm -hmm. it off. Uh, 
but it is also classified as an addiction. It's an acceptable It's the manifestation of an overinvestment in a, in a particular payoff from a substance. Mm-hmm. But this just has social re- reinforcers that are positive. Right. You, you get acclaim and, and credit and money from being a workaholic. Mm-hmm. But it's the same issue mm-hmm. that is. the hole right. that needs to be filled. We all have something. We all have something. <laughs> Yes, we do. So, um, so it's probably good that I didn't try any of that other stuff. So, so, <laughs> yeah. but, but the problem, you know, when we start looking at this, um, we find that there's cert- there are certain neurotransmitters like ADD has the problem of not having enough norepinephrine and epinephrine. Now, if you're, if you're, uh, addicted to, to alcohol or nicotine, which is interesting when people in AA right. stop drinking, they start smoking. Yes. And so it's a, because it's the same neurotransmitter they're stimulating. They often just get a replacement addiction. Right. It's and, a replacement and religion addiction. For, uh, one of the criticisms of AA is that the AA movement becomes a replacement addiction. Right. You know, and but, but sometimes if you haven't addressed the problem initially, I, I mean, I foresee a, a future, a future, I foresee a future where neurotransmitters will be measured early on. And if we have a lack of neurotransmitter where we genetically, we will have that actual neurotransmitter replaced. Well, and that have will to find then a way to deliver it directly to the brain though. Yes. Because but, if you go through the blood brain barrier. But we deliver amphetamines to the brain for ADD. Yeah. And there's very little side effect besides tachycardia for that. <laughs> Which, which can be a big deal, fast heart rate. So, um, but th- you're right. We'll have to find a way to deliver it. But they're looking at ways to do that kind of thing. But, but when you look at the drugs that people are addicted to, nicotine and alcohol stimulate the opioid receptors. Right. So that get make calming, decreases pain, decreases anxiety. Also, GABA, which is something we give people for pain, for neurologic pain, it stimulates GABA. So um, if we look at opiates, they stimulate GABA and mm-hmm. hit the uh, the same thing. It's a little different. People who are addicted to alcohol aren't necessarily addicted to opioids and vice versa. Um, stimulants, amphetamines, right. or any other kind of stimulant that is like what are the other well, some of those are, some of those are also used as appetite suppressants. Right. You know, not just for ADD, but one of the side effects of taking the ADD medicines is you often suppress the appetite so much that these are very uh, underweight kids. That's why they don't eat. But that's why in the 60s, our mothers were so thin because they smoked and they took diet pills. Yeah. Every gynecologist pills. gave, every, I mean, I wasn't a gynecologist then, but every gynecologist just handed out diet pills. Well, that's amphetamine. So they were right. happy homemakers during the day and they went to sleep and solved their problems by drinking. So, well, a lot of them I'm not that saying that that was good, but mother, they were thin. But but a lot of them in that generation were closet alcoholics too. I mean, you know, it, we went through a diagnostic period where women were labeled as depressed who were really alcoholic mm-hmm. because they were hidden drinkers. They mm-hmm. were drinking at home all the time. And men were not labeled as depressed. They were labeled as drunk. You know, for the, for the same issues and the same level of abuse of alcohol. Mm-hmm. So we got past so that. Bad. Now we have others. Well, other but, things. but part of we, one of the things that does seem to still be true about the treatment of alcohol is that most of the people, whatever you believe the origin of the problem is, they are drinking to stop the pain, stop the the bad feelings, and now we know rather how. than to feel good. Right. Yeah. GABA decreases pain. Right. And so does opioids. Right. So they're decreasing their own pain with that. So we're learning more about the physiology and the way that these things work and the location. What we still have to learn is how to create the replacement key that fits more precisely and right. deliver it mm-hmm. so that these per- persons who suffer from these addictions are not social outcasts. They don't cost society this enormous amount of money to keep them in prison or, or to deal with the crime rate. The crime that they have to, to do to support their habits. To support a habit. And the terrible destruction in their relationships and their families. It's, it is very destructive. I'm not saying that being an addict is not a problem. It is a problem That's for a, everyone around you a and you. Crop. I'm yeah. thinking that there are a lot of things like that, that if we could treat them effectively directly instead of indirectly, 
with punishment that we could avoid a lot of uh, well, this and you, punishment you say this. and my, expense. My basic question, and this, this is your quotation, mm-hmm. my basic question for the research and political community is why are we spending so much money on preventing access to drugs instead of finding the particular neurotransmitter that is lacking and replace it? So instead of criminalizing this, we need to be treating it, and we need to be treating it as a medical problem, not uniquely and solely as a behavioral problem. And not just by taking it away and putting somebody in rehab so that they can be kept away from a right. drug or whatever they're addicted to. That's not to. enough. And it's not it doesn't work. work. Right. So it is a complex issue. It is an issue upon which we are making progress, but our decision makers and legislators and regulators need to, we, we believe they need to become aware of and, and support these new breakthroughs in research and medicine and move away from criminalizing and punishing and controlling uh, people's behaviors. More compassion. Yeah. Less. People deserve it. I mean, it's not a character logical failing. It's a disease. Yeah. So you have to have the disease model that makes sense. And then there's a treatment model that can can apply. And we're looking forward to that. All right. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.